Hi everyone. This is the first in a series of screencasts that are going to carry us through the end of the semester. I'm going to, my goal here is to try to keep each one to about 10 minutes. I'm not sure how many I'm going to do each week or for each unit. Um, we are just, um, we're just going to jump in though. Uh, you know, it feels like it was about 10 months ago when we were all in class together on Friday the 13th, very ominous. Um, but if you remember last we left off um, in unit three, we were moving into our discussion of relics and reliquaries. And this is going to directly connect to the readings that um, you'll be doing for next week. It also connects to unit uh, the unit three assignment as well. Relics and reliquaries contributed to the rebirth of large scale sculpture. And the cult of relics, this devotion and dedication to relics is primarily a Western European phenomenon. In Byzantium, and here we see an example of a Byzantine icon above. Um, in Byzantium, icons of saints were valued more highly. So we see a kind of cult of image in Byzantium in the East, and we see a cult of relics in the West. Um, Byzantine image theory held that a picture of a saint was as authentic and powerful as his relics. But in the West, and we're looking at um, a reliquary here that we'll discuss in more detail shortly, um, in the West relics were extremely highly valued by medieval Christians, and medieval Christians in Western Europe believed that uh, relics were capable of producing miracles. The problem is, though, is that the relic itself, the tiny bit of bone or um, lock of hair or piece of fabric, they're really not that much to look at. So you need to encase relics in these reliquaries that are uh, precious vessels encrusted with jewels. We see pieces of enamel work. We see uh, precious metals relief sculpture um, to create this really stunning, um, stunning, richly decorated reliquary to highlight its contents. All right, let's take a closer look here at this amazing reliquary sandal. I mean, it's, it's just, it's fascinating. And we are looking at the reliquary sandal of Saint Andrew, and this is held in Trier Cathedral today um, in uh, present-day West Germany. The patron is the Archbishop Egbert of Trier. Egbert, also in line here for best name in medieval um, in medieval art, and. Egbert had this really prolific um, workshop that he um, that he um, supported that um, produced a lot of Ottonian metalwork. And there's three main surviving metalwork pieces that were most certainly commissioned by Egbert. Um, and what's interesting about these three clear surviving pieces is that they show us um, a real diversity in style and workmanship. Um, that there were a lot of different, um, a lot of different um, stylistic impulses at the same time. What we're looking at here is um, a, um, a masterpiece of goldsmithing. The gold base contains a coin of Justinian on one of the short ends, and you can see that coin here on the bottom right. Um, that holds an encrusted jewel on the top. There's also a Merovingian, so this is an early, early medieval French brooch that is included here. So these are two examples of spolia, where earlier works of art are appropriated and incorporated into new works of art as a way to strengthen their claim to legit um, history, to legacy, um, this is a common spolia. Um, the use of spolia is a common practice in reliquaries. The 
form of this. So we have a sandal that belonged to one of the disciples of Christ, Andrew, whose brother is Peter. Um, and the reliquary itself is in the shape of a foot on this pedestal. And this is what German scholars call a speaking reliquary, where the outer form tells the viewer what the hidden inner contents of that reliquary are. All right, let's look at something else from our friend Egbert. Okay. Um, oh, you guys, I realize I should have put this in presentation mode because you can kind of like see this stuff from PowerPoint here, but you guys are cool and you're just going to ignore this for now and I'll try and think about this later. So this is a staff reliquary that uses iconography to promote the claims of what the C or the Archdiocese of Trier um, wants to promote. So we have um, all, we're looking at the top of the staff. This is very ornate. And we see little tiny enamel plaques here, here, um, some larger ones above that give us portraits of the apostles paired with some of the earlier bishops of Trier. There's also other sets on the uh, reliquary staff that pair popes with some of the later bishops of Trier. And that, I think, is really key again. So we don't see spolia being used here, but instead, this pairing of portraiture suggests a greater lineage, a greater authenticity for this relic. And there's evidence and documents that say Egbert put the reliquary to frequent use. Um, and uh, that Egbert, um, these documents describe how he used, um, he used this reliquary to uh, call for the end of a drought, for example. Um, he also liked to um, carry it um, in processions, um, overseeing important meetings as a way to increase his authority. All right, here we have another um, example of large-scale Ottonian sculpture. This is the Otto Matilda cross um, that shows us the crucified Christ here in the center. Below him is a serpent. Of course, this is the serpent of Eden. And we also have elements of enamel plaques and so the detail that you see here on the right that is actually down below the serpent here on the cross and in this detail you can really see the kind of sophisticated enamel work we're looking at here um, enamel is um, glazing the surface of instead of ceramics the way we typically think of glazing um, it's glazing the surface of um, metal and what we have here are uh, the depiction of the Abbess Matilda. Here we see Abbess Matilda depicted here on the left. And this is her brother Otto on the right. They both wear regal clothing. And what's so interesting is we have a depiction of a cross. And in the middle of the cross, we see in the middle of this enamel, excuse me, we see the sibling pair here displaying a processional cross. This is the Otto Matilda cross itself. So we have a representation of the cross on the cross and it shows us how these processional crosses would be attached to a wooden staff and be used in, um, in liturgical rituals. So Matilda, she's the abbess of the um, Abbey in Essen, which was a really powerful convent in the Etonian period. Her brother is Otto I, who is the Duke of Swabia and Bavaria. They were the grandchildren of the Emperor Otto I, and their uncle is Otto II. So Otto I, Otto II are both emperors. Um, they are the grandchildren and nephew-niece of those of that line. 
This cross demonstrates the very close relationship between the royal house, the Atonians, and the abbey in Essen. So Matilda actually became abbess here in 973, which gives us the first, the earliest possible date for this work. And her brother, we know, died in 982. So that limits us to, you know, we're looking at that kind of time frame here. And um, the clothing that they're wearing, um, these kind of pale blue silks, the uh, kind of dark rusty brown silks, this came to the Etonian Empire in the form of gifts from the Byzantines. And if you remember, again, uh, remember way back to two weeks ago when our world was so vastly different and we were still having class together talking about that um, really uh, deep connection between the Etonians and the Byzantines. We see similar fabric actually in Essen, um, in the convent and also in the Essen Cathedral. And those silks were also used to wrap relics. And, um, and so it's interesting to, uh, to see that displayed here as well. Um, she, Matilda is also really interesting because she's shown as an equal patron here with her brother, but she's not wearing her nun's habit. She is shown not in the costume of an abbess, but she appears here as a member of the royal family. She is shown um, as the sister of Duke Otto, not as abbess, um, is shown really in this patronage role. All right, you guys, I'm going to wrap this up and I'm going to continue with our next one here about Otto II, who um, it's um, this Otto and this Matilda's um, uncle who married a pr princess from Byzantium. And there's some really cool stuff we're going to take a look at. All right, so I'm going to post this right now.